Something happened at work quite recently with the release of my Planescape video. A co-worker of mine loves the game, and when I told him I was doing a video about it, he seemed excited to watch it. When he did, he sent it out to everyone on the research team, and well... I guess it was kind of interesting? People took notice. In my constantly cynical way I have of judging my own success, I wasn't exactly sure it mattered. That wasn't until I started receiving emails from people outside of EA who told me that I should be pursuing opportunities in game design. Especially the one I received from a former Tiburon designer. Anyway, it may seem like a brag, but I don't honestly know what to do with any of it. Working on a game of your own while working for a big studio is more than likely an offense worthy of firing. You are under a non-compete agreement and NDAs, and believe it or not, this is standard practice at most big studios. It sucks, but so it goes with so many hobbies I either don't have time for or have tucked away in the great sock drawer of my mind so I don't have to dwell on how much I miss it. Every time I play a game, however, or write a video, I can't help but think about how I would have designed a game differently. Perhaps that's hubris or just the nature of game design analysis. Either way, my mind constantly turns to the game I designed many years ago that I started but never finished. So I thought I would do something quite different this time around. Let's make a game, using as a reference of design, a list of five things that I desperately want to see in RPGs in hopes that I will, someday, have time to actually make it. Before we get started, you're going to see a lot of seemingly unrelated footage in this video. Though I will try to keep that to a minimum, it will be difficult to do because we are talking about a game that does not technically exist. I find that when designing anything, it's important to design the theme of a thing before moving into the fun stuff. By fun stuff, I mean the wild and crazy world of creation. So what is theme? I've explained this theme thing exhaustively before in regards to literature, but here, it's a little different. In literature, the theme is more about overriding emotion or weakness that the characters share that they must overcome in order to grow as people. Your watch is broken. In a game, the theme is more about how players express themselves through the mechanics of the game. So the theme for Super Mario Bros. would be movement. You express yourself through movement, either on the ground or through the air. In Tyranny, the player expresses themselves through choices. So what kind of game am I trying to make? Well, if you've watched my previous videos, specifically the very old ones, you might have a loose idea of what I am drawn to in most games. I'll define this in much more succinct terms. I desire a game that lets me, the player, express myself in a way that is appropriate to the character I'm playing. For example, in Thief, we play a master thief whose hearing is nearly supernaturally good. We use shadows and a variety of thieving tools to traverse a non-linear map to steal or to spy. We thief, therefore, we steal. But we do so in a way that makes sense to a character like Garrett. Since my goal in life has been to play a game that comes as close as it can to replicating my experiences with pen and paper games, this game will be an RPG. The player will have their choice between different classes, and each of those classes will have unique ways of tackling objectives. So this game would be a lot more like maybe a Divinity Original Sin than, say, Destiny. Our theme would be straightforward. Player expression through creativity. Now, I wrote a video a while back in which I state in the title that open worlds are rubbish. People don't like that kind of thing, and I don't blame them. The point of all this is that I don't hate open world games. I hate that they are used in damn near every game as a crutch instead of designing something smaller that feels truly free. Instead of tightness in design, you make a huge world that has very little of substance to do in it. But because the world is huge, and you can drive or walk anywhere you want from the very start, it fools players into believing they have freedom. But when you stop to look at it, your choices are pretty limited. With a couple of games like GTA being the exception. But at the same time, subject to the same criticism. This game that I'm proposing will be an open world, but of a much smaller scale. It'll be about the size of Florence in Assassin's Creed 2, with some other zones which act as mission areas. The open world structure is the best kind of world for this kind of emergent gameplay model that I'm going to be proposing here. That's not to say it doesn't work in more linear games, but for this particular game, that's what I'm proposing. What is the protagonist's goal in the game? To overthrow or kill the tyrannical king and place himself or someone better on the throne. 
very simple. Now, let's move on to part one. A minimalistic design approach. Games need to sell in order for there to be other games. Yeah, I know. That's a real no-shit revelation there, but the profit motivation for making games goes a really long way to muddying the waters as to what is the priority. Games in a AAA market require an inordinate amount of marketing to get eyeballs on a product. To justify that enormous cost, games must be designed with features that are known to sell. At least that's what a marketer will tell you. A game in a AAA studio must take for granted that their next open world game must be the largest or at least close to the largest, which would explain why so many open world games now feature tedious grinding, tedious exploration, tedious side mission content, and so on. Because if a game is long, that is back of the box material. That will move copies. Also, fetch quests and horde quest modes, they're, they're damn easy to design tons of. And you can reuse maps, and you can reuse assets. I mean, am I right, Destiny? So in a way, design is driven by marketing, but not directed by the people doing the marketing. Marketing doesn't go to designers and say, hey, this has to be an open world. It has to be an open world because that's what's moving copies. We know that large games sell, so the logic follows, make the game big. But big is not just defined by size. My idea is to define a large world by the density of things there are to do within it, not by its scale. Dungeons & Dragons, the pen and paper game, has a clear and distinct advantage over games in that it allows for content to be developed on the fly as players, who are often unpredictable, do things the Game Master couldn't possibly predict. That is, in my opinion, why Neverwinter Nights was, and still is, on the list of all-time best-selling PC games. I mean, that's not saying much, <laughs> but for an RPG released in 2007, 2.2 million copies is quite a lot, especially for an RPG that got poor reception at first. Neverwinter Nights allowed an unprecedented level of interactivity in the world and allowed GMs to create content on the fly, just like they would in a pen and paper game. This is usually when the best moments are had because when you're pressured to create something on the fly, the Game Master unintentionally sets the player up in hilarious circumstances that go hilariously bad. How can you do this in a single player game? Well, this is a complex topic, so it deserves its own section. But for the case of brevity, I will try my best to sum it up here. When you design a quest, you can do it as a heavily scripted series of events, or you can simply define what a person wants and script the event in a way that it can only be completed if that goal, item, or mission is attained. Now, heavily scripted events work well for linearity, but if you want a game that allows for emergent gameplay like the kind you find in Divinity Original Sin games or like Metal Gear Solid 3 and 5, you must define the end goal as loosely as you possibly can. Place obstacles in a way that prevent them from getting what they want easily, and allow the player to tackle that obstacle in a variety of ways given a complex set of tools. With this type of design, the complexity comes from the design of the levels and not from the scripting. I will illustrate this design philosophy with a story of player choice. A wealthy merchant tells us that a local blacksmith has developed a special method for folding metal but is refusing to sell his blades to the merchant and only sells them to the local armies. If he had the blacksmith's notes, he could probably teach his forge master those secrets. Now, this may sound like a mission, but it isn't. The merchant doesn't say, hey, go steal those plans for me. He simply has a desire for them that he tells the player about. The player is met with an opportunity at this point that arises naturally. In their journal is an entry labeled Opportunity blacksmith who folds metal. In a heavily scripted game, you would have events that the player must trigger in order to get to the next set of events to open up, but in our game, we don't have time for that. We are less concerned with scripted events and more concerned with player freedom. In a minimalist approach, the player now has a choice. They could choose to talk to the blacksmith and maybe try and talk him into making him a blade. That might work, but it is also a very expensive proposition, because this blacksmith now has to violate the law in order to make you a blade. The player could also sneak into the shop at night and steal the plans. If they do that, they must either sneak past the guards, kill the guards, causing a ruckus that might attract other city guards, control a guard with a spell to get him to steal the plans for you, 
or set the place on fire and steal the plans when everybody's running out of the place to get water. Either way, the item is marked stolen the next day when the blacksmith realizes they are gone. When the player goes back to the merchant, he could sell him the plans, or if the player is a skilled blacksmith, learn the technique themselves. All of this is possible because of two simple variables, the need of the NPC and the stolen status of the item. All of the choices in dealing with the guards are baked into the guards' AI and don't require scripting. For instance, sneaking is a built-in mechanic. Charm Person spell allows you to control an NPC, and that is also a baked-in mechanic. It's not scripted. And setting the place on fire only requires a fire to be started somewhere with oil or kindling. The AI will be designed to try and put out fires in their vicinity. This is a good way to create a distraction. And again, all of that is baked into their AI. The scripting for these events are minimal, and as you could probably tell, the results could be hilarious because the player is making their own fun, and that fun can sometimes backfire. It is in this minimalistic design approach that allows the player the freedom to make their own fun in the game world, and allows the developer an easy way to design scenarios in a small but dense world. This also allows the player to experiment with the world to see how the AI will react and possibly opening up new ways to play. Where the heavily scripted way of design focuses on controlling the player, so they will experience a predetermined set of events, a minimalist approach to scripting leads to a more mechanics-driven design that can be easily designed within a vertical slice. That vertical slice is important because you're designing your entire game in what essentially amounts to one single area. You design small, and then build upon that into a full realized world. Now, imagine that fully realized town where every NPC is important in some way, but also fully disposable. A world where every possible choice the system allows the player to make is a valid way to tackle any given obstacle. This is possible in a small open world, but in a vast open world with a hundred dungeons, eight or nine towns, and over a hundred square miles of land, it just isn't something a team can do within a reasonable time frame or reasonable budget because there would be far too much content to design. In this example, the game may be as much as half as short as another RPG game that focuses on quantity. But the value here is in the replayability. The game neither overstays its welcome or forces the player into doing the same thing the same way more than once. Brings us to the end of this video, uh, part one. Part 2 will be talking about exploitable systems and the importance of letting your player express themselves through whatever means that is available to them, even if that means exploiting the systems. I uh, just want to thank the patrons and uh, tell you a little bit about what this series is going to be about now that you've seen it. Uh, this is going to be a more instructional kind of series which will come out as I can make them. Uh, essentially it's going to be very animation heavy, so these are a lot longer to do, so they're going to come out in chunks. Uh, I'll still be doing regular videos, I guess you could call them. Uh, I started playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey recently, and it is an expression of some of the ideas that I expressed in this video, so it might be perfect as a follow-up to this video. Um, and aside from that, I just want to thank everybody for coming to the channel, checking everything out. And uh, for all the new subscribers that joined here recently, I wanted to say hi to all y'all. And, uh, you know, if you want to talk to me or follow me on Twitter, those links are going to be below. And you can uh, talk to me personally on uh, Discord. I'm on there quite a bit. And, uh, yeah, the next video should be coming out here pretty soon. I think probably about a couple weeks, maybe. Um, but, yeah, until then, this has been a rant from Strategy. And now that you heard it, go play some games.